just what you're gonna do when I need grace. When I need grace to three and say a prayer down for love and up for air underwater over joy water for thirst to sow water for thirst to sow baptize me into your love oh my spirits overcome body mind and skin and bone love i'm gonna make it known love i'm gonna make it known
Testing one, two. Good morning, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone here to uh, First Baptist Church, Gallup, New Mexico. Everybody say amen. amen. All right. We want to be on the right card here. My name is Leon Cottrell. I'm glad, proud to be here to uh, witness with you and deliver a little bit of music and messages and stuff like that. So I'm going to start off with uh, a song, uh, Forgive Me, Lord. There's a lot of times we don't take the time to ask God to forgive us for things that we do, things that we've done, things that we say, where you go. You know, uh, a lot of people think that it's all just all summed up in a prayer, but they forget to say, forgive me, Lord. You know, sometimes we, we forget to say, forgive me for things we've said to people that we know, things that you're not even thinking about sometimes. So the Lord put on my heart to sing this song this morning. If I've done anything 
that I should not have done. Please forgive me, Lord. And if I've held on to sin and refused to let you in, please forgive me, Lord. Lord, in my heart, I am sorry for the time I ignored your call, only to call on my own. Tell me how could I make it alone? Ooh, 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 ooh. Cause it was I who strayed away. There's really not much I can say. Forgive me if I've done you wrong. Forgive me for taking so long. Now I understand your purpose for my life. Forgive me, Lord. If I've done anything that I should not have done, please forgive me, Lord. And if I've held on to sin and refused to let you in, please forgive me. Lord, Lord, in my heart, I am sorry for the times I let you down, only to call on my own. Now tell me, how could I make it alone? Ooh, ooh, ooh. Cause it was I who strayed. Away, there's really not much I can say, but forgive me if I've done you wrong. Forgive me for taking so long. Now I understand your purpose for my life. Forgive me, Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Thank you. All right, at this time, we're going to bring the praise team up, and we're going to uh, sing some of them good old songs. Everybody say amen. Amen. amen.
It's good to see you this morning, and while you're standing, will you please take your scriptures and turn to Genesis, the 22nd chapter, and as we read, we're going to ask God's blessing upon message today and our hearts, First, very first book in the Bible, Genesis, the 22nd chapter, we'll be reading from verse 8. Genesis, the 22nd chapter, verse 8. And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went on together. Father, your people have assembled here this morning. We're grateful today to be in the house of God to offer up our prayers, to read from the Holy Scriptures, sing sacred hymns and songs, to proclaim truth so that the generations that follow may know that there is a God and He provides salvation. Bless the people who are listening. Bless those who are watching. 
Bless those who are seeking you. May they find you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. We're glad that you are in services today. And we got off to a pretty much winter start last week. And I'm doing a new series of messages on wisdom from the patriarchs and the prophets. Last Sunday, I focused on the subject that today is time to seek the Lord. And that could be true of every day. It could be true of uh, what may be the condition of your heart. Could be something for those who have walked with the Lord for years and we're seeking the Lord. Sermon title today is Seeing Beyond Today, Knowing God Will Provide. When we begin to think of patriarchs and prophets, we have to realize that a patriarch is one of the scriptural fathers of the human race of the Hebrew people. Abraham was a patriarch. The major and minor prophets are the ones who basically have a divine message that have been given to them, and they are those who proclaim it, utter it in their speech, sometimes in, un, in unimaginable distress, prophets proclaim a message to the people. So a patriarch is simply a spiritual or a scriptural father using a biblical example and a biblical definition. A prophet is one who utters divinely inspired messages. Most of us in this room have made this statement at some point in time in your journey of life. <coughs> Pardon me, you'll say something like this. I know God will provide. God will provide. And we make that statement sometimes as a prayer. Sometimes we'll make that statement trusting that God is going to provide. And it could be in many areas of your life. He may provide a physical need. Maybe you need uh, certainly an answer that will come dealing with um, need that we may have because of financial resources that may be lacking. Or maybe you need a job and you'll pray that God will provide an opportunity for you to have employment. Or God will provide wisdom for you to address an issue that you're facing. And there is nothing that we can do about it at this very moment. Human people have something quite in common with all of each other and all of us understand this. We all as human beings have issues that we have to address and we make a discovery, a surprising discovery that all men and women who have lived not only in biblical times, the ancient ones, oftentimes they are referred to, and they have grappled with some of the same problems and crisis that we face today. What is one of the great frustrations that people have from the dawn of time is the inability to see beyond today. We may have some hunches. We may have some insight. We may be able to make a few predictions but we cannot say with certainty what's going to take place tomorrow. Truly, it is a gift to be able to go through this day, go about life, and that would be whatever you consider important to you, receiving nourishment, drinking water, paying a bill, enjoying family, on a day off from work and labor, 
But none of us are guaranteed tomorrow morning. We will go to bed, we will wake up, and it's a new day. It is a gift from God. He has provided another day of life. God has made people with amazing memories. We can recall things that took place years ago. We can recall things that we have learned, possibly, as a child in school. Or maybe you have had some experience. And experience has taught you a great deal about living life and how to achieve the things that you go about doing. But in that process, we have the ability to retain knowledge from the past. But God has not allowed us to see going forward of what's going to take place tomorrow, next month, next year. Some of us may have 75 years ahead of us. Some may not have quite that long, but we cannot see tomorrow. But God compensates that, not knowing the future, through the Holy Scriptures, and he compensates this with an item that we all trust and believe in, and that is faith. Faith. When you walk out the door today, many of you came to this building where the church meets, and you drove a vehicle of some sort or fashion. You had faith this morning that when you cranked it, it would start. It would warm up, and it would take you to your desired destination, which happens to be here. All of us have a great deal of faith that when we walk out this door, we will get in our vehicle, and the key will unite an ignition, and we will start, and we will go home. And it's by faith you do that. You have faith in many things today. And so when we begin to look at the journey of life of Abraham, he said something that we have often said ourselves, but much of the time wondered where exactly did it come from. You'll find that Abraham answered, God himself will provide. The lamb, speaking to his son, which I'll address, for the burnt offering, my son, and the two of them went on together. When we begin to look at this, we realize that it comes out of the book of Genesis. There is 50 chapters in the book of Genesis. And many people will say something like this. Well, I don't really believe the creation story, which only takes up three chapters in the book of the Bible. And that is in the portion of Genesis. When you read through the book of Genesis, you will discover that over a fourth of the book of Genesis deals with Abraham's life. The other patriots, Isaac and Jacob, take up a large portion of the rest of the book of Genesis along with Joseph, who concludes the book of Genesis as the Exodus experience is about to unfold for the nation of Israel. It is in my desire in these series of messages that we gain wisdom from the patriarchs and statements that they made and in the journey of their life to apply to our life so we can honestly say this morning, we may not know what the future sees and we may not know what it is, but we have faith that God will provide. He will provide for me as an individual. He will provide for me and my family. He will provide the needs that I have going forward, and God will provide. If there's anything that we can come away with today, we can be assured of the fact that God has our best interest at heart. He has created us uniquely in our mother's womb, he has given us his grace and his mercy as followers of Jesus. And he desires that we understand life and realize that God is going to provide. Technically, the story of Abraham is in chapters 12 through 25. And you'll find that he had some of the same issues that we're going to face. 
He was coming from a pagan background. You might want to take your Bible and just turn back with me, if you will, to the very first verse of chapter 12 where the story of Abraham, known as Abram, begins. Verse 1 says, The Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land that I will show you. He had to leave three things. He had to leave his father's household. He had to leave the country of which he knew and the people group. God was about to do something amazing in Abraham's life. Leave your country. Leave your people. Leave your father's household. The reason why I'm saying that this morning is simply this. No human being in the history ever faced more uncertainty, literally blind uncertainty, than Abraham did. From the gods that he knew about from the Babylonian Empire until the time of which this begins to unfold, the story of his life, Abraham journeyed by faith. All of us in this room are journeying by faith. All of us trust that God will provide or we come to that conclusion. Maybe even today, you'll find that he traveled into Egypt because there was famine in the land and he brought his wife, Sarah, with him. As he appears before the Pharaoh, he basically lies. He tells that Sarah is his sister, not his wife, because she was a very beautiful woman. And um, he had to journey in that area of his life. He had a, a nephew named Lot. And in his journey, the, the uh, uh, flocks got too large and their herdsmen were arguing with each other. And Abraham and Lot made a decision to separate at, as Abram, as he was called, and he separated from his nephew Lot. He gave him first choice. Lot took the better looking journey into what would be called green pastures and plenty of water. And Abram took off into the desert and God had gave him a great promise. It is amazing. Then chapter 13, he gives Abraham the land. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth. And over and over, God provided for Abraham and his wife, Sarah. You will discover that Abraham had to go and rescue his uh, nephew, Lot, from captivity. And in chapter 15, Abraham was promised a son. And God says to Abraham, your offspring will be like the stars in the sky. He took him out at night from his tent, let him look up into the sky and said, I want you to see all the stars. Your offspring will be like that. And Abraham struggled like many of us do. God provides salvation. God provides answer many as our personal prayers and we still doubt and even sometimes disown God. He even took matters in his own hand. In the 15th chapter of Genesis, he basically had a child with Sarah's handmaid by the name of Hagar. His name was Ishmael. And chapter 17, verse 5, God is in a conversation with Abram again, and he says, you're no longer going to be Abram. You're going to be called Abraham. Most of us know the story of Abraham and Sarah by those names. They started out as Abram, changed his name to Abraham. And in chapter 18, Abraham interceded on behalf of his family, like many of you would do, praying for a son or praying for a daughter or praying for grandchildren. Sometimes we pray for parents and grandparents. We pray for extended family members. We pray for friends, business associates, people that we come in contact with Oftentimes on a daily basis. Why was he praying for his son? 
I mean, his nephew, ne- like a son, but why was he praying for his nephew Lot? Because he chose to go into a place called Sodom and Gomorrah. And it was a terrible place of sexual immorality of every description. God sent his messengers, sometimes referred to as angels. They went into Sodom and Gomorrah. And Abraham continued to plead with God. If you can find 50, if you can find 45, if you can find 30, if you can find 10. And the conversation ended with 10. The messengers arrived at Abraham's, Abraham's house. Or pardon me, let me say, Ab- Ab- had spoken to Abraham, went to Lot's house. And they said, you and your family need to leave because the Lord is about to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. They actually had to take Lot and his wife by hand and lead them out of the city and take them and direct them to the mountains. They told him not to look back at the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. And Lot's wife did and turned into a pillar of salt. Abraham had experienced all of these things in his lifetime. In chapter 21, Sarah became pregnant and she laughed. And many laughed with her. Abraham was 100 years old when he named his son Isaac, another of the patriarchs. When we begin to understand this this story and how it unfolds into our life, we need to understand that there is always participation. God is in the process of using us in the journey, and he prepares us. Many of us in this room understand preparation. Now, I know that in the time of which we have lived, whether we realize it or not, um, there have been some businesses that have flourished during the pandemic, and one of them is in the camping industry. Do you realize that if you chose to buy a camper during the pandemic, it was a difficult purchase because everything was sold? At one place, there were places where there was multiple travel trailers and multiple motorhomes And all of those have been sold at record rates. Let's suppose that you're going camping and you understand something about the simple idea of preparation. It may be that you need to pack proper uh, clothing for whatever you may be doing. You may be packing certain types of food that you plan to prepare or what products that you need for the camping trip. And then what kind of tools or what kind of pots and pans and plates and all the things that you will use on a camping trip. God works through preparation. The initiative for Abraham came from God and he prepared for him to move. Abraham had been content uh, content living in the status quo of the land of Ur of the Chaldees. And God broke into his life. And that's what happens oftentimes in our journey of life. We find that Abraham, like us, lived life. Sometimes we live life with multiple family members and children. Abraham had to leave and be alone. Then his wife was also barren and They had no children. There's nothing noble in human beings that causes them to seek after God. Rather, we understand God is in a business of drawing men and women, boys and girls to himself. We are challenged in the New Testament church to lift up the name of Jesus. And he promises that he would draw men and women, boys and girls to himself. But when Abraham had to leave his country and his kindred and his father's house, Jesus said something that mirrors that very much 
which is alive and well even today in our lives. When we have people who are closer to us, it must take second place in our life. If any man or any woman, any boy or girl loves their mother and father more than me, they're not worthy of me. Jesus calls us to make preparation in our life to know him, to trust him, to follow him, to repent of our sin and allow Christ to come into our life. And we are in a journey of preparation all of our lives. And this is a process. All of us have a process. Just like a mountain climber prepares himself or herself for extreme feats of climbing mountains, going up steep grades, walking many miles, having to have the proper gear and equipment. We have a process. You'll find that even in the journey of Stephen, in the seventh chapter of Acts, it is said that the glory of God appeared to our father Abraham. We do not know how the glory of God appeared to him, but there is a process, a process in all of our lives. There are times when we become so miserable with our life, we are desperate for a change. There are times when God literally speaks to us. It may be listening to a Christian hymn on the radio or watching a religious broadcast or maybe going into a religious bookstore or finding some kind of religious material. It's amazing to me as a pastor of this church, people who come by during the week and want to know, do you have anything I can read? They may not have a Bible. We always offer a Bible. They may want to have something to address an issue in their life. We oftentimes lead into conversations where people will hear the gospel message. Some will accept, some might not accept. But here you have Abraham, and he all of a sudden heard the voice of God speak to him. He left his Babylonian gods that he worshiped all of his life. He moved forward with one God in his life, and God filled his life but he could not see beyond today. That is a common thread that we all have. We step out in faith in trusting God. We step out in faith by surrendering our life to God. We step out in faith asking God's forgiveness of the sin in our life. And too often, we fail to do that. We fail to ask God's forgiveness. We fail to ask him to forgive us of our sin. And I firmly believe you have to ask for forgiveness of your sin nature as well as the individual sins that you do. See, we're not born good, get bad. We're born with a sin nature that causes us to rebel against God and God gives us an opportunity through his grace and his mercy to seek his forgiveness and invite Christ into our life and allow him to be the Lord of our life and to forgive us of all transpass transgressions that has caused us to be separate from him. Righteousness was cre accredited unto Abraham because he believed there was one God who was providing salvation. Abraham's commitment to God's call was not just a path of roses. See, oftentimes we assemble in church and think all the people in the Bible had a perfect life, no problems, no struggles. They didn't even have any complaints. But as you become a student of the scripture, you will find that there are many issues that the people of God faced. They didn't have a perfect life either. Case in point, David got to looking at a woman that wasn't his wife. Long for her. It even gets more bizarre. Her husband 
was in the army. David assigned him to go forward in the battle, then told the commanders to pull away from him so he would lose his life in battle, then took his wife as his own. Sounds deceiving, doesn't it? Is it sinful? Yes. And David had to repent of his sin. David had to restore his life. Abraham didn't believe God at periods of his life. God had promised him an heir who would come through his wife, Sarah. But like most of us, we get impatient. We like to run ahead. We like to do it our way. And what happens when we do it our way most of the time? We get ahead of God. We forget to have a quiet time or two. We don't believe he's going to answer on our timetable. And so we do some things out of the ordinary. We do some things we probably would not normally do. We do some things that the natural man will do. And here, Abraham had a son by the name of Ishmael. Sarah, when she became pregnant and had a child, she became quite jealous. And I don't blame her. She wants to be the number one woman and her son to be the heir of Abraham. Hagar was cast out of the tents. And God heard her prayer and said, A great nation will rise up through your son, Ishmael. But the child of promise is going to be Isaac. Do you realize that we're in that same conflict today with people groups, different portions of the world, and who has been promised the land? For you see, Abraham was promised the land that his foot would step upon. And you will find that he had a provision that was going to take place in his life. We're going to fast forward. Isaac was born. He grew up to be a little boy. And Abraham came from a tradition where they sacrificed the children. And so in chapter 22 of Genesis, God instructed Abraham to sacrifice his son. Sounds strange to us as initial readers of the Bible, but it all comes into God's supernatural plan and his direction that is guiding the world. Abraham had to take his son, his only son, a son of promise. And here he was, a man over 100 years of age, and he was taking his son. Verse 2 of chapter 22, Then God said, Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah, and sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I will tell you about. Now, in this journey, they brought their servants with them. They had animals who carried the supplies. They were walking. And when they arrived at the place, he, verse 5, he said to his servants, Stay here with the donkey while I and the boy go over there. We will worship, and we will come back to you. Here is a man who is a man of faith, but he's also struggling. He believes God's going to provide, but he hadn't provided yet. Here's the dialogue with the son. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and placed it on his son Isaac. He himself carried the fire and the knife. As the two of them went up together, Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied. The fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham answered, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering. When Abraham began the journey, he did not know that he would find a ram 
snug and captured in bushes by his horns. You will discover that when we reach the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar, ranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and took a knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven. And the calling is emphasized. Abraham, Abraham, here am I, he replied. Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram caught by his horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it on a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh is the Hebrew term for this phrase. God will provide. If there's anything that we need to capture in our life today is that Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh, God, the only God, provides. He has provided in the past. He is providing today. He will provide in the future. No matter who you might be or who you may think you are or what you may be doing in your present life, God is the one who has constantly provided. He has provided for physical needs. We have been blessed beyond measure as a people group. We have the best food to eat. We have people in this room who are not hungry. We have water to drink, some of the purest in the world. You may not like the taste always, but it's good water. We may not know and even claim all the blessings that have been ours in our lifetime, but in our journey, as you look back, you will always see how God has provided for you in your life. He has opened doors of employment. You know, God, many, many of God's people say, well, I need some money. Well, I've heard people who turn down two or three jobs in a week's time, but they still don't have any money. Kind of reminds me of the story of the flooding that took place and the whole geographical region was flooded. And boat came, helicopters came. Guy didn't get in the boat, didn't get in the helicopter. Finally, he died in the flood and went up to see God and said, why didn't you answer my prayer? Well, I sent people by to pick you up in the boat and the helicopter and you didn't get in. You know, same thing with jobs. You know, you pray for your money, but you got to go to work. That is what we need to see how God provides, and he always provides. And it's always never too terribly early, I've discovered. It's right at the time when we need it. Sometimes in the middle of the night, we praying to God, and he reveals to us or answers our prayer and maybe even gives us instructions what we need to do. You know what I firmly believe? I firmly believe God wants us to get up, accept what he has provided, and go for it. But too often we're complainers, griping. Here Abraham did what God called him to do. He called the place Jehovah Jireh. God, the Lord, will provide. And to this day, it is said, the mountain of the Lord will be provided. God will bring us to that mountain in our lifetime. He will bring us to that point of a crossroad. He will bring us to our wits in. And then he provides. You know why? It's not what I've done. It's what God did. It's not what I can accomplish with my abilities and skills. It's what God has provided. He uses me as his instrument. He uses you as his instrument. He uses you and me as the people of God to cry out to a, a world, a nation. God is going to provide. I ask you to claim that same promise today. When you look at the scriptures, 
When you read through the Bible, my God will supply all your need according to his riches and glory in Christ. Even at the very beginning of Genesis, the third chapter, the Lord made for Abraham and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Consider the ravens, how they neither snow nor reap. They neither storehouse nor born. God feeds them. How much more valuable are you than them? Father, this morning people have listened intently. And in this moment, I would ask that we would all reflect for just a few moments of how you provided. We simply want to say thank you for your provisions today. Thank you that you have brought us to a place of a mountain, a crossroad, even at our wit's end. And you have restored us and have blessed us and provided. Now today, God, May your people, may all of us, including myself, trust you to provide going forward from this day, from this service, from this place, and being able to say, Jehovah Jireh, God will provide. Praise team will begin to sing, I surrender all. And today I'd ask that you surrender all. That means your life to him today. I ask that you surrender your ability, your skills, your talent, your spiritual gifts to God to be used in his kingdom's work. I ask you to give your life to Christ, follow him in believer's baptism, join this church, not perfect church, but one who proclaims simple truths from the scripture. Father and Reverend, as you stand, praise team begins to sing. I'll make my way to the altar. You step out and come to Christ today.
invite you to study the scriptures with us in the uh, Bible study time. Um, it's been historically called Sunday School. It begins at 9.45. We invite you, your family, to attend Bible study group here at First Baptist Church. Uh, as on your way out, please place your offering in the basket as you uh, walk out the door. I want to thank the praise team for singing and always looking for people who can play instruments and sing. Uh, we are in a transitional time. For those of you who may not know, our worship leader, Mitchell White, has resigned his position. So we trust that God blesses him in his future plans. But as we go forward as a church, we ask God's blessing. And um, we're going to sing a song as a benediction. So, the order 